All right, and good morning. I guess it would help if uh, Mike was actually unmuted, right? It is Monday, and my apologies for all of the live viewers. We are experiencing some technical difficulties, and I didn't discover that up until everything was set up, ready to go. And instead of delaying, losing everything that I have put together and trying to upload it, trying to find it, trying to highlight it all over again and losing even more time, I figured might as well just record it, put it on YouTube, have you watch it, and then while you do that, I'm going to actually go back on a computer and try to figure out what in a world is going on. I'm going to guess that I probably just haven't restarted my computer in a very long time because I have been working on all kinds of crazy projects from uh, <laughs> cryptocurrency, uh, learning and development, all the way to the website stuff that I was just trying to figure out how to do, all the way to doing deep dive research, all the way to, well, a lot of things. So I have been incredibly, incredibly busy. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. Mine was absolutely fabulous. Uh, I was very, very productive. I have done a lot of work, uh, have managed to injure myself, thankfully not too badly. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily made for construction work. Uh, I understand it, uh, but I probably shouldn't do it because I do tend to be a bit accident prone sometimes um, and uh, this was one of those times and I just had about I don't know a thousand pounds worth of uh, sheetrock uh, basically follow me so um, anyways nothing is broken everything is working everything is functioning a little bit of bruises a little bit of uh, uh, scrapes but that's about it so it didn't like fall fall off of the sky because that probably would have killed me it uh, just basically leaned on me and we just both landed on the ground with the thing on top of me. So that was uh, quite a bit of a feat to actually get up with that thing on top of you and push it back in a place. And thankfully, I didn't have to do it myself because it would have never happened. I did get some folks to come in and assist. So that was quite lovely. Um, and we were able to actually push it back on and off of me. So anyways... Uh, Today we actually have very, very important and interesting stuff to go over, discuss, talk about. And, uh, you know, I, I, I will do some catch up on the cryptocurrency stuff, of course, as always, because, you know, I feel like I cheated you maybe some of that stuff. Uh, but I did want to focus on a couple of different information and news and rulings that have changed uh, how we're going to be able to invest. One of them has to do with 401k and the access to private equities, and we're going to discuss what that all means. And the other one has to do with the new SEC ruling about accredited investors and who can qualify now. They actually have expanded it, so there is a potential that you now qualify to be an accredited investor. And if you don't know what any of this stuff means, that is why you're here. That is why you are here for Money Matters, watching it. Well, I was going to say live, but today we're not doing live, although we do a live show every single morning at 7 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on OneDealAway.com live. And that is where we're going to do Q&As on all of that stuff. Unfortunately, today, because of my tech challenges that I have just told you about, we are not able to do that. However, do leave comments in YouTube channel. I do read those. I do respond. I will uh, interact with you. Of course, you can also check me out on onedealaway.com on the social media, which is actually streaming right here underneath uh, this uh, image. And uh, you can find us on, uh, oh my gosh, Telegram. Uh, we do have a Telegram channel. It's uh, uh, Money Matters, uh, right? Or One Deal Away. Either one will work. You'll be able to find us. And uh, that is how we can definitely interact. All right, let's do this. All right, well, it is officially the last day of summer. Well, it's nearly not. <laughs> we still have a few weeks left of summer, but it is officially the last day of August, right? 
And that is almost like the end of summer for most of us because guess what? Many of the kiddos have started going back to school or have they? Are the kids back in school? Do you know? Does anybody know? I don't know. Uh, but anyways, if they are, I'm sure that uh, many of the parents are petrified and excited all at the same time time i know that many of the schools are starting and uh, fingers crossed they will continue going for the remainder of the year and we don't have to do another one of those lockdowns uh not as fun i do not recommend it <laughs> all right so let's talk about the 401k let's discuss that piece first because that does affect vast majority of individuals, vast majority of Americans. And so, of course, 401k is the retirement savings account, right? Um, and it really is. It's just in a savings account that basically you, you try to leverage with some equities, maybe with some debt, meaning uh, uh, bonds and that kind of stuff. So let's take a look at what these puppies are, how they work, and I uh, found a very interesting uh, article that I'm like, okay, this is very cool. It gives us a little bit of photos and it's not just me yapping at you, but we all get to look at some cool stuff. And they had some cool statistics um, that I just simply didn't know. And I think it's very, very cool. So one of the things that you know is that there are things called pensions and then defined contribution plans, right? And so pension is basically what everybody used to have way back when. And then somebody somewhere at one point trying to basically cut the taxes. I don't remember who it was, but I'm sure you can search it online. Uh, this was, I don't know, uh, quite a few decades ago. I'll lie to you if I give you the date. So I don't want to give you a date because I don't want to lie to you. Um, but anyways, the idea was that you have all of these wealthy individuals who were trying to figure out the way to pay less on taxes. So 401k was something that was evolved that said, well, what if these individuals who already are making quite a bit of money could actually take some money and, uh, you know, put it into this sort of deferred method where, you know, they'll still pay taxes, just not right now, so they can invest tax free. It was meant to be sort of like an additional thing for very, very wealthy individuals. And uh, that got approved and, you know, they were using that stuff and it was very cool. And then somebody somewhere, as usual, right, gets an idea and says, well, wait a minute. These pension funds cost us a lot of money. I mean, you are guaranteeing that, uh, you know, when they retire, they will get a gold watch, which is really expensive. And that, you know, we will take care of them and their family all the way up until the point where both the employee and the spouse pass which is could be potentially a very very long time because you know people started to live much longer and nobody was thinking that wait a minute they retire when they're 60 but they live their 80 i gotta carry them for like 20 more years without any productivity from that person well there's this thing called 401k and what if we were to basically say well we're not gonna pay it but you can participate and of course we're going to match you up to like three percent percent so they started to compete on that next thing you know they're cutting a lot of expenses and they're going this is brilliant so one company hears it from another next thing you know boom we have defined contribution plan being the primary vehicle of america's retirement system 401k assets total 29.2 trillion as of September 30th, 2018. Now, since then, we've of course had almost two full years, and that basically means that this number is well over 30 trillion dollars right now. I don't know how much exactly it is because I couldn't find it, but anyways. So, the switch from pensions to 401ks has been so thorough that 50% uh, of all workers uh, now have access to defined contribution plans. I actually have found an article somewhere that I couldn't find. I found it somewhere else that uh, this number actually is not 50. It's actually closer to 67% of individuals that are in defined contribution plan. And what does defined contribution plan means? Well, it basically means that you are contributing to your plan right and your plan is defined meaning as much as you contribute as a good of an investor you are that's how much money you will have come retirement time the problem is that we were not taught how to invest 
or how to manage our money. We're not taught anything about personal finance in schools or most colleges, right? And so there are no such classes. So while we are expected to do this for ourselves, we're not given education about it. So mm, somebody said somewhere and said, you know, maybe we should give people these things called financial advisors. So that is how that industry was born, where now, because people have to save for themselves, but they don't know how, there was a new thing that was developed called financial advisors. And, you know, if you think that this kind of came in to be nice to you and I, you are incorrect yet again. My apologies for all kinds of bad news today. Because what ends up happening is that these companies were kind of coming in and saying, yeah, we kind of got to do this because we want this 401k money to come to us. So Fidelity and Vanguard and all these big old names that you're very, very familiar said, we got to get these people to give us money because that's a lot of people. That's a lot of money and they don't know what they're doing. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give them financial advisors, right? Free of charge. Just come on over here. You sit down. You work with me. I help you figure out. Of course, these financial advisors are technically speaking glorified salespeople for these very much companies. And they said, you know what? In order to protect the public, it's always to protect the public. And whenever the government says that they're going to come to protect you, you better be very, very afraid and hide your money. Hide your money and your kids maybe too. Um, so what they did is they would say, well, we're going to provide them with things, but we don't want everybody to advise that. So we're going to create these series of exams called Series 7, Series 63, Series 82. It will come into play soon. All right. So these are basically exams that these advisors have to read and study upon and then take these exams, pass them in order to qualify to become uh, financial advisors or traders or whatever, right? To work in the financial industry. And we're going to cover those things uh, later in this episode, I promise. It will all make sense by the end of the whole thing. And so that's how, how we're going to do it. But because, you know, there's many smart people out there who don't want to actually work for us and who don't want to sell the financial products that we have to offer because that's the only thing that the salesperson can sell, right? If I had a salesperson, you know, for my book, for example, which is right over here, not right over there, right over here, right? I have to figure out right over here, right? I would expect that salesperson to only sell this book, right? I don't expect them to sell all of the books. Now, of course, a bookstore would sell all of the books, but the salesperson that I hire to sell my book would basically just do that. And if you were to call up my salesperson for my book, you would only get my book, right? Does it make sense? Same thing goes with these financial advisors who are also glorified salespeople. Most of them, some of them are very, very good, but vast majority, not so much because it's a very, very short study. It's a very, very few questions and you can get it in a matter of few months. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be really good in math. You don't have to be a very smart individual. You don't have to understand finance. You just need to pass this exam, meaning remember, memorize and regurgitate, which is not knowledge. Uh, and then just basically peddle my products. That's it. That's all you got to do. That's how you become an advisor, financial advisor. Ah, I don't know how I feel about that. But anyways, they didn't want everybody under the sun. So they all colluded together. And I'm using that word strategically to basically say, well, the only way that you can get into this license is if you're sponsored by the firm that is part of this stuff. So you got to be hired by the member of the company to sell their product in order to qualify to sell the product. Nobody else can do it. Ah, and if you try to create your own company, good luck. I actually, this weekend, you know, I was traveling and doing all the stuff, but whenever I drive, I tried to catch up on all of the different podcasts and stuff. And I was watching this uh, really amazing, uh, well, I wasn't watching, I was actually listening, but it was a YouTube video. So there was a video happening, I just wasn't watching it. I was only listening uh, to it while I was driving and it was just kind of sitting there playing in the car. And uh, um, it was an interview between Raul Paul, uh, which you know, he's a founder of, of a Real Vision and, and, and a macroeconomist that I really like and follow. 
and uh, Simon Dixon. Simon Dixon is uh, basically a fund manager who originally was in the, in, you know, he was a banker and then micro market maker. Now he actually is uh, controlling, well, controlling, he has a business basically that helps fund uh, cryptocurrency projects and uh, digital currency innovations and that kind of stuff. So that's, that's the industry that he is in. But they were having a discussion how both of them at one point were going to start their own banks and uh, trying to go through all of the regulations and stuff. Like it's, it's, a, it's an insider boys club. The, the, the ability to start it and do it is nearly impossible. And in order to do it, you actually have to hire people who already do Like, you understand, right? Like, you and I, this is the circle and you're out of it, right? <laughs> so, um, anyways, that's kind of how this industry works, just so you know. It'll all make sense, like I said, when we start talking about it. So, what is going on within the inside of the 401k? Well, there is a few different stats that this particular uh, site offers. 84.9% is participation rate. So about 85% of employees are participating in it. The deferral rate is 7.1%. Uh, there are 10 different options typically within these funds. And the popularity of the automatically adjusted funds is rising, which is about 77% of those who are participating. And the adjustable, uh, uh, automatically adjusted funds um, are those sort of like the target date funds, right? Like the, the, the 2040, the 2030, the, the, the 2060, the whatever, right? Which is sort of like, when do you plan to retire, you know? Um, that kind of stuff. So, and then they balance uh, between like equities and debts and that kind of stuff. So the bonds and, and stocks um, and kind of put it in. And, um, you know, those balancings are all off. They're all wrong. Um, but anyways, a lot of people do it because it's set it and forget it. And you don't have to worry about it. Um, now, fees are really high. Average is about 5 point, uh, sorry, 0.52%. However, they can range from 0.3% all the way to 2%. <clears throat> now, if you're thinking that 2% is not really big deal, you don't understand how this stuff works. You definitely want to go out there and read about it. One of the places that I can recommend you to read is the book called Money by Tony Robbins. Now, he wrote it, but he interviewed a bunch of people. It's not the only place out there. They do peddle mostly in the stocks and bonds. But the most interesting story, the reason that I bring it up, has to do with the Vanguard founder, okay? And he's basically explaining how all of these mutual funds, because that's the majority of what you can invest in. Even though you have 10 options, you basically have 10 mutual fund options. And it's probably going to be something like five of them are, you know, the, the bond funds and five of them are equity funds. And uh, they kind of play pretend that it's different, but it's really not. And they're all basically in the same stuff. Anyways. I have all kinds of op opinions on mutual funds and I'll probably do uh, a full-blown education component. One of the key things that he has actually said is that you put, when, when we are talking about mutual funds, which is what is in these things, in 401ks, which is why I'm not a big fan of them at all, um, is uh, that you put in 100% of the risk, meaning uh, take 100% of the risk, uh, because, you know, it can go up and down. You put in 100% of the money, which, right, that's who's funding it. But then you only get 30% of the profits because 70% is taken through all of these different fees. That is how much this about 2% counts for. So there you go. That is why you could never, ever win because it appears really, really small, but it's cumulative and growing. 2.2% average all-in fees, and they range from 0.2 to 5%. And most people don't know this because most people don't even look at that kind of stuff. Anyways, you definitely want to look at that stuff. And uh, this is kind of like, you know, the people are unhappy with the sponsors, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, they are wanting you to subscribe and stuff into their blog and into their stuff. And, um, you know, there you go. That's, that's, that's what the news is over here. Now, that's what's happening with 401ks. However, there is a new ruling that has happened. And it basically says, the Department of Labor basically says that 401ks 
can now invest in private equity funds. This is coming from Investopedia, so you can definitely read it. Certain types of managed private equity funds in 401k are allowed now. It does provide employees access to investment that are normally not avail only available to wealthy investors and institutions. And we're going to talk about that as well in today's episode. New guidance will result in diversification and higher returns for small investors. Alternative investments um, are too risky and fee intensive. And the guidance does not allow direct investment in private equity. So what does all of this basically mean? It means that there is what is basically private equity. Private equity is going to be very illiquid. You have to remember that piece. So when you go out there and buy, say, Tesla or Apple stocks, because, and I'm using that as an example, because they're going through the stock splits, and of course, everybody's going bananas. Um, so anyways, um, if you were to buy it, you can, relatively speaking, unless the market just pff, tumbles over, but right now, you know, um, you can go easily and sell it. It makes it a very liquid investment. You can go in, you can buy it, you can sell it within seconds, you're in and out of the stock. Uh, private equity is not so much. It's uh, kind of like as illiquid as real estate, probably actually even more illiquid than real estate, right? If we think about real estate, when you buy a house, it takes a little bit of time. When you try to sell it, it takes a little bit of time. Now, I know it's a seller's market right now and everybody's going bonanza crazy. Everybody's, you know, buying houses. But even in the best of the markets that we've talked about here on Money Matters, where house sold in what, like seven days? I think that that was the record or nine days, something like that. It was a super short sale, right? Uh, not short sale, like short sale, but like short time periods to sell. Even then, right? Is sold, but you know, it takes a little bit of time to kind of you know sell it and dispose of that asset. That's what makes it a bit more illiquid. Private equity is even more illiquid because what ends up happening is that private equity you're putting in money for startups, for uh, you know, new businesses, for that kind of stuff, and of course, they do pose quite a bit of risk as well. So when I go in and I put in some money into a startup company, right? Uh, you know, you don't know what you're going to get, right? That thing could be next Amazon and it could be next whatever name of the company that never really made it anywhere. So it's a very, very risky business, uh, but the returns are insane. Imagine if you were to, you know, go in and put in, I don't know, uh, hundred dollars for example into amazon when bezos was on the floor wrapping books getting them ready and taking them over to the post office to send them right at that point you probably could have received i don't know 10 percent of the company I, I'm, I'm making things up obviously right and so but now you go in and uh, 10 percent of the company is a very very large number right uh, maybe you didn't get 10 percent of the company maybe you got like I don't know, 50 shares, right? 50 shares. Well, 50 shares for 100 bucks, and now one share is, say, $2,000. You do the math and see if it makes sense or not, right? So the returns are absolutely insane if it actually goes anywhere, but it's also very, very high risk because vast majority of the companies don't really make it, and even smaller amount makes it to the point where they're as big as Amazon that we just talked about here. So that's kind of where the risk kind of comes in. The other part is that, you know, unless you know the owners and unless you qualify as a credit investor and all of that stuff, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment, I promise, um, you have to go through the private equity firms. So now we have an article right over here. It's coming out of MarketWatch, and it's just an opinion that basically is, you know, the way that is set up is really not set up for, again, you and I to benefit, but for these guys, well, not for these guys, but you know what I mean, uh, for the private equity to take the money. Because every time, and I'm going to leave the guys because I do like this photo, it's quite amazing. Um, oh boy, have we got a great fun for you. I love that. I absolutely love it. I'm like, yep, yeah, nope, sleazeball, run away, run away. Um, so a lot of times when we heard about, and we talked about it in this, uh, I want to say last week, so go to the YouTube and watch it. Um, when we talked about a lot of the companies that we're seeing now uh, going bankrupt, 
and the reason that we lost Toys R Us is because of the private equity. They would jump in, buy it on the forward earnings and the assets, and then uh, suck out the money and all of the good from it, leave the empty shell of the company that then just sort of uh, goes bust, and then they move on to the next victim. So they're like vampires. They go in into the healthy companies, they suck them dry, and then let them die, and then they move on. So that's the reason why and I also do think and so they're saying from the Department of Dangerous Ideas as opposed to the Department of Labor. So I love this. Love this. It's really funny. Uh, from the Department of Dangerous Ideas comes the news that your employer may soon offer you opportunity to invest some of your hard earned money in private equity. Ah, opportunity. I don't know. So obviously this is not as positive of an article. There are definitely some opportunities when you go into the private equity, especially if you direct invest into the business with your money and you know the business owner and that kind of stuff. And that's the piece that I prefer. Uh, but I don't trust private equity or vulture uh, capitalist. I mean, sorry, venture capitalist. <laughs> So anyways, as you can see that whenever there's money, there's greed. And when there's money and greed combined, you stand a chance uh, to be taken advantage of, especially if you don't know what's going on. So if you're going to play in this stuff, just be very, very careful. None of this stuff is financial advice because I don't have Series 7, 63, 82, 3, whatever, right? I don't have them. I don't want them. At one point, I did want them, but I don't want them right now. So none of this stuff is financial advice. Do your own research. Do your own studying. Do your own due diligence and make your own decisions. Think for yourself is my number one motto that I have for you. This move would give 401k participants, ordinary people like you and me, dear reader, access to allegedly superior investments return that private equity provides. Yeah, so what they're basically saying, this is going to be an amazing thing because why would you miss on some of the great gains that these folks can get into? But they don't always explain to you the risk. So you go in and a lot of us just focus on like, oh, look at how much money I can make, look at how much money I can make. It's like, did you see how much risk you might be taking? Most people don't think about it because the only way to get wealthy, you got to think of capital preservation first, then growth second. Preservation, growth. You want to preserve and grow your wealth. Preserve and grow your wealth. You have to have both and preservation has to be first because if you cannot preserve it, then you have to go back and figure how to earn it yet one more time. All right. So when we invest, we want to preserve our money and then potentially grow it. And of course, we want to grow it, but preservation has to be the key. All right. So some private equity exposure might be reasonable for an aggressive investor, she said, but it had better be small. With private equity, she said, you don't really know what you're investing in. And that's coming out of uh, one of the uh, uh, founders of Omega Wealth uh, Managers, right? So. Uh, there was other people from the you know financial advice and stuff. I wouldn't recommend an allocation to private equity in 401k at this time, just as I would not suggest other esoteric investments like cryptocurrency in 401k. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that. I think that both do have a place in it. It's just a matter of understanding the risk understanding who you are, understanding your age. So there's a lot of different components that you have to play around with, right? And, uh, you know, when I tell folks is that if you go into some of this stuff, again, not a financial advice, just the way that I like to think about it. If you go into any of this stuff, private equity, cryptos, any of the stuff that is, you know, alternative investment, uh, which is the only investment that I actually invest in because the mainstream... I don't, I don't trust it. I don't like it. Um, so anyways, uh, uh, just my opinion um, anyways in, into this whole thing is that you don't want to bet the farm on it, right? So you want to create a, a, a diversified portfolio of things, right? And, uh, you know, you don't want to put money that if you lost, you're going to, you know, uh, never recuperate and recover. And for some of these things that are higher risk, you definitely don't want to borrow. So you don't want to borrow money to go and, and bet on risky stuff. When you borrow money, you're going to do it 
for things that are less risky, less volatile, so that you have ability to protect yourself. And of course, you're going to put yourself in a position that this thing can preserve vast majority of your wealth and then not just keep up pace of with inflation, but also beat it at its own game. And then you're going to use leverage uh, together combined with inflation to actually start reducing it over time so that your equity uh, versus what you owe, meaning the balance sheet goes from you know, obviously it's going to always balance, but between that asset liability, that the liabilities are going to go down, asset is going to go up. And uh, I know it doesn't make sense, but like it has to do with owner equity. And uh, if you watch any of my education videos, uh, whiteboard videos, as I like to call them, then it kind of makes sense right now when I'm like balancing my arms and stuff, it doesn't. So make sure you watch uh, some of those as well. Okay, let's continue. The typical private equity manager charges 2% of asset and annual fee just for showing up, then takes 20% of profits. That is correct. So yes, uh, vast majority of the funds, it will be two and 20 is what it's known in the industry. And that means that it's 2% from the get go when you come in to actually invest with the fund, they will take 2% in fees, they will invest the rest of it, right? So if you invest $100, $2 goes into the fees, they invest $98 of it. And then whatever profit comes in, they take 20% off of the top, you get the rest of it. Now, their goal is to make actually money. So if they don't make money, they don't get that 20%, you don't get the 80%. And of course, they have to beat the market. Now, here is a little bit of the stuff that I kind of agree, but it's also not complete truth. And that is the fact that it has to do with the, uh, you know, what they're talking about. So uh, according to New York University School of Business, the average gross nominated uh, nominal return for S&P 500 has been about 12% uh, a year since the 1920s. Now, uh, you know, we've had years that are, you know, in uh, much higher than that. We've had years that are way, way lower than that. We have years that haven't done anything of that. So, but anyways, I'm going to keep that uh, alone. Here is the part that I will uh, talk about and uh, not dispute, but sort of uh, offer my opinion on it private equity fund that charges you uh, 2% a year in fee plus 20% of the profit has to make about 17% in year in gross profit. In other words, it has to be about 40% better. And do they even outperform the overall market? Well, nobody really knows because the industry is opaque and investments are illiquid. You got to remember that illiquid, meaning you can't just get rid of it because there are no buyers out there. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you do the uh, uh, private equity, meaning uh, private investments in the businesses, in the companies and that kind of stuff, um, they will actually have you agree that you're going to lock up the money for three, five, seven, ten years even um, and you have to understand it that when you put in this ten thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars or whatever it is um, that in that stage you you can't have access to that money for whatever uh, period of time uh, that they basically stipulate in it that's what you agreed to and if you really 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 need money you're going to have to find another investor that is going to basically buy you out or potentially if the company you know unexpectedly takes off much faster than they thought and analyzed they would or could then if they do have money and ability then they might be able to buy you out and then they will hold more shares uh, from it or other investors might decide to split it and that kind of stuff so that's something you definitely want to pay attention to you also want to pay attention that a lot of times when you do this sort of uh, private uh, um, investments and that kind of stuff typically not always but typically the minimum investment uh, you know, for some really, really small funds and investments and that kind of stuff is going to be 10,000, super rare, almost never happens. 25% um, seems to be more of that average low, low, low end. Then we go into 50 to 100,000. And uh, then there are funds uh, that are very, very well known, some uh, hedge funds and that kind of stuff that uh, without 100 to 500,000, you can't even play and then there's of course the super elite funds that without a million don't even call them all right so you want to understand all of those components um, but one of the things that i wanted to dispute right over here or give my commentary on it is that 
um, oftentimes these companies will be able to get not just 17 percent a year they'll be able to get um, 20 30 40 50 percent of the year um, in the end and if they are uh, correctly positioned in the asset class that is growing exponentially think crypto right and DeFi maybe where you know getting returns such as 17x in 30 days is not unheard of or if you go into real estate and invest in the way that I teach in real estate on the cheap challenge or uh, flip it online masterclass um, you can easily get um, two to five uh, X return on your money within a few months um, and uh, sometimes you can get as much as 10 to 20 X and I think on Friday right before we broke I told you that I was doing which which kind of just reminded me I told you that I was doing uh, private coaching with a student who has agreed to record the coaching session and stuff so I have received the, the recordings and stuff I don't want to share it right now because uh, we are she's preparing for the auction we were preparing her for the auction to go in and we found some amazing deals um, I will only tell you that the deal is going up for sale soon and I cannot share any details right now because um, you know I don't want to create more competition for her I want her to be successful I want her to find something and so we're really really excited for it but we did find the first thing that you know when I was teaching and showing her the first thing that I did is uh, one of the amazing amazing properties that right now has over 20x return on your money if you can get it for the price that it is but because it's an auction we don't know exactly how it's going to play out so it will be definitely interesting one to watch and uh, if you're watching this I uh, thank you very much for the Friday good luck best of luck um, trading and that's for my student my friend my um, you know uh, um, you know I mean my students become my friends um, you know best of luck Sonia I wish you all all the best and I am excited for you and let's see what happens at the auction so um, I will share stuff with you but I will wait until it's too late for you to be able to mock things up for her because you know not saying that my audience is evil meaning people but you never know who's going to see these videos right so I do my best to protect my students and their best interest and uh, I was so excited I will tell you I was so excited about uh, this particular auction I was like oh man I should have gone in but because my student is going in I am not I am stepping away because she's the one who found it and it's hers all right so here we go uh, and, uh, 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 okay so that's basically the biggest thing that I wanted you to be aware of now I want to switch over to the new rule for the SEC is making for the accredited investors now if you don't know the SEC is Securities and Exchange Commission and they have formally adopted the new accredited investment rules expanding the group of Americans who can invest in private securities remember we were talking about private securities private options and that kind of stuff private placements and you have to meet certain threshold in order to invest that means that you have to be either sophisticated or accredited investors and for best deals now they're saying the riskiest deals but I say the best deals you have to be an accredited investor now <clears throat> what is an accredited investor what does all of that mean that is exactly what we're going to cover right now then the new definition which lets individuals holding certain licenses meet the definition of accredited investor and currently include individuals um, so the credit investor right here it is right over here let me see if I can make this a third bigger yes let's make it a third bigger so you can actually see the stuff all right so a credit investor in the US which currently includes individuals who have a net worth of more than one million dollars uh, that does not include primary residence or annual income greater than two hundred thousand dollars or three hundred dollars for married couples or entities that meet certain legal requirements and holdings have access to private financial markets the broader public does not so when we have some amazing amazing deals when we find it and stuff like when I do uh, for example like syndicated deals and we find something amazing 
vast majority of people cannot participate in that even though we do offer and provide anywhere between 12 to 15 percent uh, per year guaranteed uh, rates um, all the way up to sometimes even 20 25 percent on super secure properties right because i like properties i like properties a lot um but vast majority of people cannot participate in those deals because they're not accredited. Because in order to be accredited, your net worth has to be $1 million or more. And if you don't know how to calculate your net worth, you definitely want to look that up. But you basically take all of your assets, right? Everything you own, then you deduct all of your liabilities, meaning everything you owe for those assets and whatever is left over is your net worth or as they call it in business owner's equity that's your personal balance sheet then when we talk about the income right you have to have earned uh, uh you have to have an annual income that is greater than two hundred thousand dollars or three hundred thousand dollars combined so if you're married and have a spouse and uh, you know together you make three hundred thousand dollars or more for the last two years and you expect to do the same this year as well of course then you qualify and that is the test that is how we find things out the proposed modernization would appear to include persons who are licensed to sell securities but who otherwise did not previously qualify to buy uh, to buy private placement as accredited the potential to add a certain academic credential or similar uh, certifications might grow the space more, but this has yet to be properly defined. The SEC itself acknowledges that the expanded definition might not grow the pool of accredited investors that much. We do not expect the number of newly eligible individual accredited investors to be significant compared to the uh, number of individual investors that are currently eligible, and we expect the amount of capital investment by such newly eligible investors to have minimal effects however they nonetheless have uh, expanded it so this is the piece oh we come the full circle don't you love the full circle stories i love them all right so the document indicates that only individuals with series 7 65 or 82 certifications would qualify for now so they're basically saying this is what the sec had said and you can look it up yourself i've read the whole document you can read it as well but basically what they have said is they're expanding it to some home offices indian tribes blah 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 so they're expanding some of the things and you know llc's now can invest but you have to have five million same thing with the home offices and that kind of stuff so um there's there has to be significant holding in assets and that kind of stuff, but you can invest it. What they have realized is said, well, wait a minute, you know, um, I mean, th the whole thing is stupid, right? Just because you happen to have a job that pays you $200,000 a year does not make you financially intelligent, okay? So that's an error number one. Error number two is that just because you have millions of dollars also doesn't make you uh, financially intelligent and just because you don't have two hundred thousand dollars income or one million dollars in net worth uh, that you are not financially intelligent so the rules are sort of outdated and stupid uh, but they are the rules and there's nothing we can do about them now and the reason they're saying is that they're here to protect you because if you put in fifty thousand dollars and that's all the money that you have and it all goes kaboom and disappears that for an average individual this is basically going to be detrimental and i agree with that component completely however if you have fifty thousand dollars and even if you're not earning two hundred thousand dollars and even if you don't have one million dollars in uh you know but you fully understand of what that does and you're willing to take a risk and uh you know that money is not something that if you lose it you will you know forever vanish and that kind of stuff right like it's not something you need to pay your rent and school and that kind of stuff go for it right um, and that's what DeFi does that's what the centralized finance allows us to do through using different protocols and stuff and that's why it's so powerful and so so cool but also very very risky because most people don't understand the risk they just sort of jump into it so don't do that either right so again to each their own not a financial advice now let's go back to the whole thing over here and says well one of the things that said well you know these people because of the series that they hold we know that they're going to be smart enough to be able to do it so what is series seven well um where's series seven there it is 
Series 7 exam license the holder to sell all types of security products except commodities and futures. Known formally as the General Securities Representative Qualification Examination, this Series 7 is and its licensing is examined, administered by Financial Industry Regulatory Authority or FINRA. And the 7 Series is an essential requirement for an entry level broker. And finally, Candidates who want to take Series 7 exam must be sponsored by a FINRA member firm. Okay, remember I told you, it's a boys club, and I specifically say boys club because there's not very many women, nor do they want them. Ah, shame, shame, shame on all of you. Okay, Series 65 is an exam and securities license required for individuals to act as investment advisors in the U.S., Series 67 exam, known formally as the Uniform Investment Advisor Law Examination, covers laws, regulations, ethics, and various topics important to the role of financial advisor. Successful completion of Series 65 exam qualifies an investment professional to function as an investment advisor representative in certain states. And of course, to sit for Series 65 exam, a candidate does not require sponsorship by a member firm at this moment. So that used to be a case, but it does not require it. So you can do that. That's one way to qualify and play a bigger game. The Series 82 is a certificate given financial professional representing a sponsor organization the ability to transact private equity securities for clients focused on private securities uh, transaction, also known as private securities offering representative exam. And the Series 82 does not have any preliminary require, uh, prerequisite, only requires that an individual be sponsored by an SEC registered organization. So there you go. Uh, basically, what out of all of that stuff, a 60, uh, did we get 62 or 65? I don't remember now, but you definitely want to look it up. So, and if you want to read more about it, if you go to sec.gov.gov, you can actually read the, for immediate release, you can read what it does, and they say modernize the stuff, but really it's just this small ex, uh, uh, ex, expansion of the whole thing. And, uh, you know, they are basically making it just easier to get into the whole thing. So that's it for today. I appreciate you watching. Thank you very much. My sincere apologies again for not being able to go live today. But my goal is to fix this puppy while it's being uploaded and go live tomorrow. So I will see you tomorrow at 7 a.m. only on onedealaway.com slash live. For everybody watching this on YouTube, smash the like button, subscribe, hit the bell button, and I will see you tomorrow. Until then, stay forever money blessed. And do remember, you are only one deal away.